Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session. So, in this session, uh, we are going to share new secure value transfer model with you guys. And this uh, basically this will involve both the host and the virtual IOMMU in, in QMO. Uh, before I introduce the authors, uh, let's have a, have a look at the agenda first. <coughs> in this session, uh, I'll go through a, a few background knowledge about the IOMMU and the virtual IOMMU first and then uh, told why we do need a new secure data transfer. Mm. And this slide includes two main um, components. The first one, DMA remapping, uh, which was finished by Jason Wang. And he is the current uh, the device maintainer in QMO. And the, the interruptive mapping, uh, which was finished by uh, Peter Xu here. So he'll continue to uh, introduce the interruptive mapping after me. Mm, and he will also introduce, introduce a few performance uh, results and the status, and maybe the what to do next in the future. Okay, <laughs> last one, <laughs> it's me. Uh, I have to list my name here, uh, the president by Wei Xu. Uh, otherwise, uh, maybe some people will maybe think this may be finished by me. I think it's not <laughs> not good boss to uh, just and me. Uh. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Okay, let's have a quick look at the IOMMU and the virtual IOMMU. Uh, basically, a hardware unit uh, with the IO translation and device isolation uh, is finished by a hardware IOMMU. And this uh, was normally achieved by uh, some kind of a device, DMA and the interrupt remapping. And a virtual IOMMU uh, is normally an emulated IOMMU, which works as if it's a real one. Currently, we have uh, both Intel Power and uh, some virtual MMU in QMO, which was uh, supported or partially supported right now. <coughs> and well, the only thing I want to emphasize and clarify is there is no any dependence between a hardware IOMMU and the virtual IOMMU. Mm. In other words, you don't need a hardware IOMMU uh, to launch a VM with a virtual IOMMU. The motivation behind that is quite straightforward. Mm. Of course, it's for the security concern, uh, especially well, with the uh, increasing popularity of the NFV and the DBDK for the recent years. Normally, DBDK will use some kind of uh, user space poly mode driver to utilize the system resource, both well, with CPU and the memory. So uh, this is uh, target at the, some performance critical users. Uh, which, which want, who want the both highest performance and uh, extremely low latency. In some kind of usage, uh, some nested VM without device part through will also uh, get involved with the security risk. And, but unfortunately, uh, there's no any protection uh, right now for without devices. That's why do we need a, a new model. Let's, uh, let's have a look at the current mm, uh, device at, at, at just space overview. Mm, we can start from the, uh, the top left part, uh, which is the uh, guest. We can see uh, a virtual net device, can, a driver can also be a uh, DBDK, uh, which runs inside, inside the user space, or a native virtual net device, uh, Inside, inside the kernel or uh, other device drivers, maybe, uh, maybe for some uh, interesting or some uh, stuff. So, and the memory pages here is uh, going to be used by the VRAIN. Mm -hmm. On the top, on the right side, QMO uh, runs uh, as a, as a uh, QMO provides a backend service and a memory API to collaborate with the guest driver to make it work. At least all the VDL net backends here uh, as a separate uh, box. Um, actually, 
there should be some kind of uh, backend should be also run inside that QML, such as the user space, but our backend, um, just for easy understanding. So, supposing we are just starting a new transfer, uh, uh, start, uh, we start from the driver loading. Okay, during the driver initialization, uh, the driver will um, set the memory page as the gets the physical address to the VRAIN. <coughs> and then this address will be passed to, to the QML backend service. The backend service will then will ask for translation from memory API to translate this gets the physical address to a host virtual address. And then uh, by that time, we, we, almost, we all, uh, almost get everything done. That's we have set up the, all, the, all the things for, the, for a real DMA transfer. Okay, um, it's quite exciting, huh? So finally, I got an Olympic rain, I think. Uh, but uh, something really dangerous with this model. You can say from uh, all the memory pages is going to be used by the physical address. Which means all the whole, uh, whole guest memories at just space will be exp exposed to the driver. Suppose some malicious driver is seeking for uh, for a chance. I think a typical uh, a typical attack can be easily uh, achieved by just seeking for some um, special page in the memory with uh, such as the security case or whatever, and then just put it into the very ring and export it the valid network. So this is quite a heartbeat. So I think there should be a ton of thousand other uh, hack technology uh, to to uh, attack the system. That should be uh, quite a disaster to the system. On the other hand, uh, it's a pretty awesome and elegant um, like, like green hound bus to, to the hackers, I think. I think they, they can't love it anymore. And so we we do need a new secure uh, transfer model. With this model, definitely we should introduce uh, MMU to the guest. And most of the stuff worked the same as before, except the red part. So both the guest and the QMO has a, a virtual MMU uh, here to collaborate. We can see from the uh, flowchart. This time we don't use any guest physical address anymore. Instead of that, we use the um, I/O virtual address, which can be easily achieved by just um, using the DM API in the kernel. And this address will also be passed to the QML. And after that, it will uh, the difference difference here will use the IOTLB engine lookup to gain the, uh, to translate it to the new. At, at host virtual address. So, so right now we got a, a secure virtual transfer. Okay. Cheers. Huh? <laughs> uh, recently, uh, a new feature build uh, was introduced uh, to the Linux kernel, but the uh, QML set code is still on the margin. With this feature build, uh, guest virtual device will have to use the I.O. address space instead of the uh, old guest physical address. And mm -hmm. otherwise, uh, the device will fail to, uh, fail to use but during the feature bit negotiation. Then you can't use this device anymore. So we have got the secure uh, transfer model. But here comes a new problem. Uh -huh. From the uh, new model, we can see there, this, there should be a lot of uh, interfering from the QML if we run the VHOS net in the kernel. Actually, the VHOS net is uh, the most popular backend right now because it has a very high performance and a high reliability. So uh, in such a situation, I think um, the interfering will impact the system performance dramatically. So we need further uh, optimization. And so how does VHOS survive? We introduced a feature bit from the PCIe spec, uh, which is named uh, the ATS. 
actually, the ATS is the uh, address translation device. Uh, in, in, in the short story, it should be a kind of feature bit to allow the, a specific PCIe device to synchronize the IO TLB entry from the IOMU uh, TLB entries pool. And then it can, uh, during the DMA, it can direct access, access the memory without any, uh, any interference from IOMMU. That's it, it can decouple uh, the IOMMU and the device and faster the system performance. Actually, we do have uh, considered other alternatives before choose ATS, such as uh, we can implement an individual VTD in the host. But the downside is uh, unaccept unacceptable, uh, such as it will involve a lot of code duplication with the current design UKMO. And we should pay more attention to the vendor and arch architecture specific issue, such as different CPU, uh, different architecture from Intel, Power, uh, whatever. And we, sh we should also take care of the uh, new API for error reporting. Uh, on the other side, the benefit of the ATS is quite uh, remarkable because it's, it comes from the PCIe spec and has a very nature, apart from independent personality. And more important, we can easily achieve this based on the current IMU infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. so let's have a quick look about the new device IoTLB flowchart. With this flowchart, we can see there has been a few catched TLB entries here. The field in the box uh, means address uh, start from A and has a size one, and it's read only or uh, write only or whatever. Suppose we are um, starting a new transfer uh, start from the <coughs> address D then definitely we'll get the IOTLB miss. In this case, we'll uh, submit a requir requ request to the VHOST service IOTLB API to ask for translation. It's kind of like the hardware uh, do. Uh, so the IOTLB API UQMO uh, will uh, verify this address and see if it's an uh, illegal or legal address. Unfortunately, if, if it's an uh, illegal address, then uh, this, this access will be block, block, uh, blocked it automatically uh, with the error report. And if it's a, a legal address, then a new entry will be generated and mm, write back to the VHOST kernel. VHOST kernel will uh, get this uh, update message and create it a new entry in the kernel uh, interval tree then continue the transfer. Uh, sometimes, uh, the, after the guest finished uh, DMA, then it will, um, normally in, in the kernel, normally it will uh, issue an unmap request to the IOMMU. But for most of the NFA uh, drivers, normally they will use uh, the static binding. So which means maybe they can continue using this, uh, the TLB entries, which uh, we don't need uh, more up update operations. In this case, uh, the LTLB API will all send an invalidated invalidate message to the uh, the host. The host will then will delete the corresponding uh, entries from the tree. Mm. The idea is pretty clear, I think. So this time, we got a Toronto variant. So I'll finish, uh, finish the uh, DMAR tour with the summary. Um, the, actually, the design idea is pretty uh, clear. So first of all, we should switch all the guest physical address to the IO virtual address, and then you, we should keep uh, the IOTLB cache in the kernel all the time, and make sure we always translate, uh, look, look up the entries first before we issue a request to QMO. And then uh, we should handle the synchronization as well. Oh, sorry, the data structure and the user space and the kernel interface is also uh, quite uh, straightforward. We introduce a new interval tree uh, for to save the IOTLB entries. Mm, the interval tree is kind of structure based on the current red black tree in kernel, so it has a very good 
performance for um, high frequency, high frequently uh, updates, uh, insert, delete op operations. And the message quake uh, was also introduced uh, via the vhost FD for synchronize. Uh, kind of the iterate of FD it iterations uh, was introduced to keep them serialized. Okay, um, that's all for me. Next, uh, Peter, you will introduce the interrupt mapping for you guys. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hi, everyone. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Third time. Uh, I'm Peter Xu from uh, Red Hat and I'm working on the interrupter mapping in the past few months. And I would like to uh, do a very quick overview uh, on what's it about. So as we has already mentioned that uh, we have some requirements to enable uh, DMA remapping and uh, all, all kinds of gas kernel protections for uh, DPDK applications inside GAST or something. So we just, uh, besides the DMA remapping part, which is protecting the memory operations from devices, we also need the interrupter mapping. That protects uh, malicious interrupts or something. So uh, it make it a complete uh, solution. So before going deeper to the interrupter mapping part, I would like to introduce something about uh, how the x86 system interrupt works. Uh, it's very, uh, it's very simple graph, I think. So we can see that there are two yellow boxes, which is line-based interrupts and signal-based interrupts. Uh, these two are mostly uh, the two kinds of interrupts that we are, uh, we are having now. And also we can see that there are two kinds of microchips uh, uh, already. First one is IOAPIC, which handles the line-based interrupts, something like a line-based uh, assertion or something into a uh, interrupt message onto the system bus. And the other one is called local APIC, and mostly we use a, a KVM version, which is VAPIC, uh, which is per processor that handles the uh, per processor interrupts, all kinds of, including IPIs, of course. So, uh, in general, interrupter mapping is something about, or oh, oh, I'd say interrupter mapping for vhost is something about, uh, uh, yeah, oh, it's, uh, it's in general protect guests from malicious interrupts. So, when this happens, if we do not have interrupter mapping, if there is something, for example, a device is broken or something like that, and uh, it just uh, triggers interrupts all the time, and the system will trigger the interrupt handler, that's not a, not a good thing. And what we want is that we, we want to know what's wrong there and why there is strange interrupts happening without, uh, without any reason. So we, if we interrupt remapping, IOMMU will do this for you. So if we have that, uh, when we got malicious interrupt, IOMMU will trap it and see, oh, that's something wrong. And it will have a report which is a interrupt as well to the CPU in the gas to, to, to notify that there is something wrong and who did something wrong. So to achieve this, uh, finally, we want to support vhost. So to achieve this, we need uh, basic uh, remapping support in general to, for the two kinds of interrupts already existing and also the vAPIC support, which is, uh, which is something that we want to make the interrupt faster because for the first one, we, uh, we are talking about emulated uh, IRQ chips mostly, so, but, but uh, we know that it's very, uh, it's very slow, uh, and uh, mostly we are using the APICs, so we need to support the APIC as the second, second step. Last, we need to support vhost, uh, which is the same as to support IRQFD, and uh, I'll talk about it later. I will take one example of MSI delivery in this case, before and after interrupt remapping. So before that, things are quite simple. I think, uh, I think most of the people, people would know that uh, MSI is something that uh, is that it's just we write some specific data to specific address, right? It's a memory write, and the address would be possibly something like uh, 
zero x i p e or something. It's a very specific address. And also, uh, so w when we deliver it, it, we just write to a memory write, actually from the device, right, which is DMA as well. And after interrupt remapping, things become slightly different, and we have something called interrupt remapping table. This table is stored inside guest memory. Oh, uh, I'm taking guest as, a, as an example. It's inside system memory. So, and when we configure the device for MSI or MSI X interrupts, we fill in something uh, virtual. It's not the original interrupt. Uh, original MSI messages, we fill in something virtual, so I used a orange box instead of the green one. Uh, in this box, uh, we, hide, uh, we hide something like a IRTE index. IRTE uh, is an interrupt remapping table entry, which is this one, it's a small box. We hide an index into that virtual MSI message. We use this index and to look up a specific IRT inside the table, inside guest memory, we got this IRT, we parse it, finally we got the, the green one, which is uh, the original, original interrupt. That's, oh, sorry, oh. That's how interrupt remapping is happening. And uh, when error happens, something, will ha uh, something wrong will go there. For example, it will fail to find IRT. Maybe, maybe it's empty, so error reports. And maybe, or something like uh, device A is sending, is trying to send an interrupt from device B, and there's something called SID verification, which will notify the guest that uh, uh, the, the SID ver verification is wrong, so, so somebody is trying to uh, attend to be somebody else, anything like that. So in, in all the cases, uh, error will be reported to the, to the system. Uh, so uh, previous slide talks about how interrupt remapping works. And this slide talks about how to make it faster, so, uh, which is to support the Apex. Um, the thing is quite simple, because we, uh, we have something called GSI routing table in the KVM. We have that as a, as far as I understand, uh, as a interrupt cache inside kernel, so that we can have interrupts delivered totally inside kernel without trapping into Qmu user space. And this is quite good for implement interrupt, re interrupt remapping for the APIC because we, I don't need to have another, uh, because uh, the, the thing works quite similar here. Uh, we just, what we need to do to translate the message is just to put a translated message into the routing table. So that's quite simple. And the translation is slightly different from uh, the emulated one, because uh, for that one, we translate on the fly. For example, if there is an interrupt, it's generated, we translate, and we deliver. And for the, uh, the APIC support, we, if we su support this, and we, if, if we cache the translated result into the GI side routing table, something uh, is quicker, because we, we set up, we do the translation beforehand. We just, we just translated it during setup. So when the interrupt is triggered, we do not need to translate it at all. So it's just as fast as before, even without interrupt remapping. So this one is quite easy to implement because we do not have to touch KVM at, at, at all. We just leverage GI side routing table. And uh, so we have l merely no performance impact. And oh, 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 we, we just support split. Because uh, for, for the full kernel, uh, kernel archive support, we, we cannot support that because, uh, because in that case, our APIC is in, inside kernel as well, and we cannot trap it in QMU. That's the problem. But split is quite uh, OK for us, because for one thing, it's fast. And for the other thing, it's safer, as uh, there's, a Google, uh, there's a Google presentation in this or in the previous KVM forum talks about it. So, uh, so mostly, we are using split here. This is uh, to one step further to support IRKFD. We know that IRKFD is based on a GI side routing table. We set up routing table first, we set up IRKFD, and everything works. So, uh, oh. so, so uh, basically, QMU is responsible to set up everything set up the vhost backend, set up GSI routing table, insert 
every MSN messages. And when the interrupt comes, for example, if this is a virtual net PCI, when there is some data from the tap device or something, we just got an event, which is an interrupt to vhost. vhost triggers gas notifier. And it will actually fetch specific MSN message and inject it into guest. So that's uh, how vhost interrupts works in general. And after that, we have already mentioned to support a uh, RKFD is quite simple because we are still leveraging GSI routing table here. We just translate the message beforehand. So when we set up this, we do the translation, and everything is, is cool. Well, what we need to do is to consider the cache invalidation issues because these things can be invalidated by the guest. IRTE can be changed, and uh, I didn't have slides for this because time is limited, but uh, we have something for that, for the invalidation process, which is not mentioned in this presentation. OK, uh, so I finished IR part. Uh, this is a uh, general performance numbers on what we have got. It's uh, very first. Uh, it's very immature. So, uh, first, firstly, this work, the whole work, is for DPDK and uh, DPDK only, mostly for static DMA mapping. DPDK uh, trees. Uh, DMA addresses very specially. They just uh, log huge pages, and they just map it once, mostly. They just do not change it. So uh, for DPDK case, uh, our, our work uh, works uh, quite well. We get safety, and we drop 5% performance. And it can be better in the future. And Jason should be working on it maybe uh, way or something uh, in the future. There are some future works. And, uh, but for dynamic DMA mapping, which is uh, the default one, then maybe we just use the, the default, default virtual PCI driver. And all the DMA mappings are managed by the kernel. In that case, it's uh, dramatically worse. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not good. You can see the number. I just, I just won't mention it because it's too poor. Uh, so, so, so yes, uh, we are only for the second one. And for the first, for the first one, uh, maybe I, I don't know who will use that. It. It's functionally working, but it's, it will be very slow. Current status is that uh, most of the patches are merged upstream, except uh, JSON ones, uh, QMU, DMARs patches in QMU. Uh, JSON one will be responsible for it, and it will push the patch soon. And also some IR work, uh, there are lots of IR issues, uh, thanks to Yang, Kiska, and lots of people that helps in, uh, in improving this work. And uh, so there are still lots of works to be done. And uh, so this is all, uh, all about, yeah, that's all. Mostly that's all. Oh, thank you. So do you have any comments or questions regarding to our, where is white? Wait, yeah. Do you have any questions or comments? One question. Yeah. Did you validate the virtual IMMU for both with uh, Virtio devices and Pastro devices in the same guest? That's all right. <coughs> if you validated the virtual IMMU both with Virtio and Pastro devices in the same guest? Yes. Uh, uh, what we have uh, verified is uh, currently the DPTK and MFA uh, nom normally they will use uh, the UIO driver. With the with this feature, now we can use the VFI pass through in the guest. So what we are test is running the DPTK directly uh, in the guest system, and then uh, for the nested nested. Uh, but I would device pass through, we still didn't have tested it. But in theory, I think it works. Maybe, uh, maybe in the performance, I'm not sure. So it's it's still on the to-do list. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think it's very in, uh, useful work. So uh, one thing I want to uh, have a question is, uh, you said the virtual LMU. I think also uh, in the Oracle case of presentation, you uh, also got mentioned this this work. Uh, do you actually support a multiple request ID? I mean, um, I, I don't know how the details implementation, right? How how do you 
uh, emulate or simulate the the real VTD play tables? Do you have that part covered, or because this case is just one device request ID? Right? Yes. Yeah, uh, Mm, actually, uh, the page tables here uh, we only use the Linux kernel DMA API uh, f uh, oh, in the uh, uh, in the guest driver uh, kernel inside. Okay. Uh -huh. I see. Uh, another thing is, so when you said you mentioned you you implement the ATS, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. for the invalidation part, do you think uh, having an ATS will be? Uh, do you consider having an ATS as a security problem because? When you have ATS, the device doesn't have to go through the IOMU translation, right? So he can just go directly to his IOTLB. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, uh, we can see from this uh, figure. Sorry. Uh, okay. So this figure, this here. Uh, mm, should, no, it's from here. Sorry. Here well, we should. Uh, uh, validate all the address range before uh, we mm, translate it for the uh, host kernel. Okay. So I think uh, it's safe. It. Okay, okay. Uh, last question. So mm -hmm. uh, you guys code some numbers in like a dynamic mapping. You said that, that with dynamic mapping, the performance is kind of worse, right? Uh, is that because you with ATS, you have to invite it all the way down to the device? Or sure, that's true. So every. Uh, sure. Okay, thank you. Sorry.